Thank you. Oh, that was easy. All right, thank you so much. Can, can you guys hear me back? Is volume good? Okay, thank you so much for coming out tonight and thank you so much for the invitation. Um, I actually, I just, I love giving talks to audiences like this because most of the talks I give are, you know, they're about ecology, but they're also, they have to be really mathy and really quantitative and I have to show tons of figures. Talk to an audience like this is just about the cool creatures that we're all fascinated by. So it's it's really fun for me. Well, hopefully it will be for you too. But yeah, um, as as mentioned, um, I'm going to be talking about um, plant and animal interactions in the tropics. I've worked in the tropics for around 25 years, and I've always been fascinated by how species. Hold on. There we go by how species interact and particularly how plants and animals interact. Um, so this is a shot of uh, Danum Valley, which is one of my main study sites right now in Borneo, in the Malaysian part of Borneo. And this is, uh, I'll talk about this a little bit throughout, throughout the rest of the talk, but um, this area is just phenomenal. It's, it's one of the last truly intact rainforests in, in Asia, honestly. And by intact, I mean it's never been logged. So these are this, these are original old growth trees, and it's actually barely been hunted at all. And that part is really rare. Most of the forests that are left uh, anywhere in the tropics, but particularly in Asia, have been so heavily hunted that there are no a lot of animals left. But Danum is just an incredible place for animals, including birds. I hear there's some birders in the room. It's just phenomenal. And you can see literally like. 200 species in a week or something. And these are also the tallest, I should say, the very tallest um, flowering plant angiosperm dominated forests in the world. So the tallest forests in the world are the red coast redwoods in California, but those are common. So these are the tallest angiosperms in the world. So the, the big emerging trees are 100 meters tall, just huge. So I'm going to talk today about mostly about my work in Southeast Asia. So this is um, this is Southeast Asia between Australia and mainland Asia. This is the island of Borneo right here. It's the third biggest island in the world. This is New Guinea. This is the second biggest island in the world. So the equator right, right, straddles right through Borneo. So this is full on equatorial rainforest. And I first moved to Borneo uh, right out of college. I got a job there working for a carnivorous plant nursery. So I'll talk very briefly about carnivorous plants later. Um, and I, so I lived there for a couple of years and I just fell in love with, with the creatures there, including, when I say creatures, I mean plants too, and, the, and just the jungle. And then I've been going back and working there ever since. Um, but I'm also going to talk a little bit about neotropical forests. So I, I just got back from a sabbatical in Panama. I spent four months with my family uh, in a little town called Gamboa, right on the Panama Canal, just to learn more about the neotropical because I spent all this time in the, in the old world forest, so I wanted to learn about this different biome. And then I'll give a shout out right now to a couple of the people who I'm going to be talking a lot about and using a lot of their photos. Uh, this is my wife, Olga, and she's, she's an incredible photographer. She works for the Forest Service here doing science communication, uh, which takes advantage of her photography skills. So I'll show a lot of her photos. And then this is my old buddy, Shen Li who first brought me over to Malaysia to do the carnivorous plant work. And he's a professional photographer, so I'm gonna show a ton of his shots. And then these are my kids, Joaquin and Nico, looking at a little lizard. And um, yeah, I'm not showing any of their photos, but you will, you, you will see photos of them. And the, the three of us, the four of us have done a lot of, of collaboration together. Okay, so um, the reason I think species interactions are so fun to look at in the tropics is because there's so many of them. So compared to higher latitudes like where we are here, the tropics have many more species. I think most people know this, right? But this is a, a map of vertebrate species richness. So all birds, mammals, um, fish, amphibians, reptiles put together showing you know, huge diversity in the tropics. It's the Amazon basin, tropical Africa, Borneo right here, fading up to a much lower diversity in the temperate zone, right? So most, most people know this, um, know that the tropi tropical forests are, are more diverse than say around here. But what I don't think is, is generally appreciated is that they're not just more diverse, they're incredibly more diverse. They're 
ridiculously more diverse. I mean, thousands of species to every one that we have here. And partly because of that, there are many, many more species interactions. So partly just because the diversity is so high, there's so many species out there that there's so many more species for everything to interact with. But then also we tend to get a lot more specialization. And I'll talk about this again and again, but here in the temperate zone, most, th most animals are generalists. They interact with lots of different plants and lots of different other animals. In the tropics, you have a lot more specialization. And this is just one example among many. This is the Rafflesia flower, one species in the Rafflesia genus. And it's the biggest flower in the world. So this is a single flower here. This particular one is maybe a meter across, and it grows out of, it's, a, it's, a, it's entirely parasitic. The only part of the plant you ever see is the flower. The whole rest of the plant grows inside the tissue of this tetrastigma vine. And this, is a te this is in the grape family, and the, each Rafflesia lives on a single tetrastigma species and just gets all its nutrients from it, all its water, everything. So, um, I'll start, I'll talk about a couple of different types of interactions just to get us started and compare kind of temperate zone like around here to, 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 to the tropics. So herbivory, when we think about this is a classic animal plant interaction, right? I mean, maybe this is what most people think of very first thing here, animal plant interaction, think of the animals eat plants. Um, here, we often think about herbivores being our big charismatic megafauna, which we're so lucky to have so many of around here. Um, so these are shots I took in Yellowstone. You, you guys all know what they are, bighorn sheep, elk. Now the gardeners among us will also appreciate that we have a lot of herbivory from, you know, things we might consider pests, uh, grasshoppers and whatnot. And that's true. So around, you know, in this, in this latitude, we have both. We've got a lot of herbivory from from big mammals and lots of insects. Um, I'm going to come back and talk about some grasshopper relatives in a minute. But in the tropics, there are tons of herbivores, thousands, millions of herbivores. In fact, probably most species of, of most species of life on Earth are herbivorous meals. So it's hugely important. But Arguably, some of the most important herbivores in terms of structuring the whole community in the tropics are ants. Ants consume an immense amount of the tropical rainforest, and they do that in two ways. One is that, is that some species of ants directly eat, or at least directly destroy the plants, like these leaf cutters. But even more important than that is that ants protect aphids and the aphids are the ones eating the plants. And you guys, again, we know this from our garden. I have this problem on my apricot trees. Every late in the summer, my, my apricots get covered in aphids. And the reason that things don't come in and eat all the aphids is that there are ants there protecting them. So this year, what I'm gonna do is put tanglefoot around the base of the apricots so the ants can't get up there. And then all the other ladybugs and everything else can come in and eat the aphids. Well, imagine that kind of process scaled up a thousand fold. And that's what's eating the tropical rainforest, are ants and the aphids that the ants are protecting. And if, for those of you who don't know, the reason ants protect the aphids is because the aphids stick their proboscis into the plant and suck out the juices and then excrete a sweet, um, what, what for them is a waste product, but it's full of the plant sugars, it's called honeydew. And the ants are going around licking that up. So they're farming the aphids. And in, and in order to protect their aphid livestock, um, they, they hang out near them and, and will attack any other you know, ladybugs or any other um, predators that come to eat them. Okay, so that is one of them. So protecting aphids is a, is a huge way that ants help eat rainforest plants, but then also they can just eat them directly. So this is from Panama. This is just right by our house, but there are tons of leaf cutter ants. And what they do is the whole colony will send out these workers and they'll chop, the, each one will chop a little circle out of a leaf and then bring it back to the colony. And they'll, and, and with millions of ant, individual ants doing that, they can utterly defoliate a tree over the course of a day or two. And in my office in the house we were renting, I would sit and work and look out and wow, leaf cutter ants are on that tree, 
sure enough, next day is basically leafless. And what they do, interestingly, is they're not eating the leaves directly. They bring it down into the, their underground tunnels, chew it up, mulch it, and feed it to a fungus. And then they, they, they cultivate this fungus. So it's ants practicing agriculture. And then they eat the fruiting bodies of the fungus. And that interaction has been going on for so long in evolutionary history that the fungus no longer occurs in nature other than in ant colonies. It's been completely domesticated by the ants. Okay, so I mentioned, I, I said I'd come back and talk about grasshoppers. Of course, there are lots of different kinds of grasshoppers in the tropics. These are a few. Um, oh, odd. This photo's got blown up somehow. Um, anyway, these are some ant uh, grasshopper relatives. So these three are various katydid species, and they're leaf katydids. So they're, they're evolved to look like leaves so that to avoid predation. And like this one, you think this is its eye, those are its antennae. This is its body. It's evolved to have not only a leaf, but a partial leaf that looks like it's been chewed on a little bit for, for just incredible camouflage. And this one is laying flat on the other leaf, and it's got veins that, well, they're not actual veins, but they look like the veins of the leaf to help it blend in. So that as they're destroying the plant, they're not getting eaten themselves. And this one is a patch of moss. All right, so why did I throw that in there? You can see the animal there. Yes, this is a mossy stick insect right here. So this is its head, legs, and it's on this clump of moss to which it looks essentially identical. I don't know how you can, I don't know how photographers actually can spot that kind of thing. So again, just incredible camouflage and, 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 and stick insects are uh, not in the same order, but they're vaguely related to grasshoppers as well. Okay, so we've talked about animals eating plants. Um, I can't resist, of course, turning the table a little bit and talking about plants that eat animals. As I mentioned, um, I got my start in the tropics working on this, this genus called Nepenthes, which is uh, the biggest genus of carnivorous plants in the world. They're distributed all across tropical Asia, from India to Australia, over to Madagascar, even out to some pretty remote oceanic islands. And they're just incredible, incredible plants. So the, the leaf, uh, this is the end of the leaf here, has a tendril off of the end of it that then curves around and forms a pitcher. So this is not a flower. A lot of people think this is the flower, the flower structure. This is part of the leaf. This is the end of the leaf of the plant. And they form these tubes with a lid over the top to keep rainwater out. And then inside, at the bottom, they have a, a a digestive solution. It's not, it, it's very slightly acidic. It's, you can stick your finger, it's not going to dissolve your finger. It's very mildly acidic. So that when an insect crawls along, comes up, crawls up to the, to the lip, this peristome, and then the peristome is a bit waxy, so it falls inside. Often there are nectaries too underneath the lid, so they're attracted to the nectar. They fall inside and they get digested. So Nepenthes and other carnivorous plants live in, uh, typically live in, in very poor soil, very nitrogen poor soil. And this is how they get their nitrogen, by attracting and eating insects. This species up in the upper left, that's the biggest Nepenthes of all, that's Nepenthes raja. The pitchers get to be bigger than a rugby ball. I mean, like this, like this big, you can hold it in both arms. And we've, and then this one, Nordiana, is, was right by where I used to live too. It has almost, pictures almost as big. And these can actually eat small vertebrates as well. We found um, the very first paper I ever published was on an Nepenthes eating a mouse. There's a digested mouse in one of these pictures. But then, so that's the kind of ancestral strategy, evolutionarily ancestral strategy for, for Nepenthes. But then some of them have gone off and just evolved in other directions. So this is Nepenthes ampullaria. You can see the pictures look similar to the ones I showed you earlier, but the lids are totally different. Rather than having a lid covering the pitcher, the lid is this little thing here that's reflexed back, so the pitcher is just totally open. So these have evolved to not be carnivorous anymore. 
they've evolved to essentially be litter traps. So they're collecting falling leaves, falling flowers, falling debris from the rainforest canopy, and then essentially just composting it in place, mulching it and, and getting the, their nutrients that way. And then this one, so this is Nepenthes lowii. Okay, here's the tip of the leaf blade. Here's the tendril. This is the pitcher, which is the end of the leaf. Here's the lid, again, reflex backwards. And it's being sat on by this thing called a tree shrew. It looks like a squirrel, but actually it's totally unrelated to rodents. It's more closely related to, to us, to primates, than to rodents. Uh, they, they own, there are maybe 20 species of tree shrew. They only live in Southeast Asia. And this one species, um, actually it's Tupaya Montana, it's fitting, that doesn't occur here, alas. But Tupaya Montana has this cool interaction with Nepenthes lowii, where um, it's a mutualistic interaction, meaning they're helping each other. So the Nepenthes, the pitcher plant, as with many Nepenthes, has nectaries right under the lid. So the, <laughs> this, the tree shoot crawls up and sits there and licks it and gets a little bit of sugar that way. What does the plant get in return? Yeah, it's a toilet. It's evolved to be a toilet for this one mammal species, which is just remarkable, right? How the, how how plants can evolve to, you know, interact in these kind of incredibly specialized ways with different animals. All right, so moving on then, um, another kind of classic animal plant interaction we, we like to think about is pollination, and this is of course hugely important. Um, this, so the Heliconia here, Heliconias are a, a native <coughs> genus of, um, of just beautiful plants. They're only in the New World, so they're no, you, you see them cultivated all over the tropics, but they're only native to the New World, well, with one tiny exception. And this, of course, is a hummingbird, also only found in the New World. So there are no hummingbirds in, in tropical Asia. And they, it's not a perfectly specialized um, interaction at all. Hummingbirds like lots of different flowers and heliconias are pollinated by several different things. But there is a very tight relationship between heliconias and hummingbirds. And this particular hummingbird, um, it's not my photo, but that's the white necked Jacobin, which I, I was super excited to find this photo because this, is, this was the most common hummingbird in our garden, in our little house in Panama. So we'd sit out and have coffee every morning on the deck and be, and be just buzzed by dozens of these things going to our little feeder. They're just super cool. And then, you know, it's not just birds and of course insects doing the pollination. Lots of mammals are pollinators, um, particularly bats. A lot of pollinating bats that will fly up, stick their face in and their long tongue to get the plant nectar and then come away with a face full of pollen, which they then bring to the next flower and therefore thereby pollinate. Um, so that's the way we typically think about pollination, is that the animal is getting a nectar reward, and in return, it's accidentally, inadvertently, it's maybe a better word, inadvertently pollinating the plants and helping it develop seeds. But that's not always the way it works. A lot of times, there's either a, diff there's a different reward or no reward altogether. So in these cases, these are, um, these are called euglossine bees. They're just gorgeous, just iridescent green and blue. Um, they're often called orchid bees because they do in fact uh, interact with a lot of orchids, but they interact with, with some other plants as well. Um, so the euglossine bees, the main thing they're after, the males at least, it's not nectar, it's not pollen, it's scent. And they have this fascinating behavioral ecology where in order to mate, they need to have a perfume and it has to be a perfect perfume. The females of each species like a very, very particular mixture of scents. So the male Euglossian bees spend their days traveling forests trying to find different scents and mix them on their bodies into just the right perfume. To the, and so that's what this bee is getting out of the orchid. It's not getting nectar, it's getting one of the components for the perfume it needs. And this has gotten to the point where, I mean, over evolutionary time, where when a male bee dies, it'll be mobbed by other male bees who are stealing its perfume, stealing its different scents that it's collected to help them mix their own, mix their own perfumes, which is just super cool. Um, okay, and then sometimes there's no reward at all. 
for the pollinator. So this here, this is another orchid called the bee orchid. And actually, this is a temperate growing species. Um, but the bee orchids, the this um, petal here looks, it looks like a female bee. So male bees will come try to mate with it and then not get anything out of it, but get these two pollinia stuck to themselves and then go off and try to do the same thing to another flower and pollinate the flower that way. So they're not getting a reward, they're just getting duped. Um, same thing with one of my favorite flowers, the frangipani. So this is, you know, super classic. If you go to you know, Hawaii, this is what they make lays out in Hawaii and Bali. There are frangipani all over. Amazing. Although they're native to the neotropics, they're native to the new world. But they have a, an, an incredible scent, but no nectar. So they're attracting insects with their scent, and the, and the insects will crawl all over them, but not. There's no nectar. So then they'll just leave and get duped again, go to another frangipani. No nectar, but they pollinated it. And then this, this is this is one of my favorite plants ever. Um, this is one of my favorite people ever. Um, so this is that's my son who is uh, substantially younger, standing next to an Amorphophallus hewittii, which is in the, it's an aeroid, so in the same family as calla lilies and philodendrons and um, and whatnot. And this is um, one of the biggest inflorescences of any. Of any plant. So it's not a single flower. It's actually got hundreds of tiny little flowers inside at the base of the stadix there. And what it does is it's it, the inside of that. So, that. so this is the spadix, is the central column. And then the spade is this thing wrapping around it. And the inside of the spade is purple, much like a, much like meat. And then the flower smells like rotten flesh. This is often how you find these. You're walking through the jungle, you're like, oh my God, something died, or there's no more phallus into it. And sure enough, you can look around and find this thing smelling like rotten flesh with the color of rotting flesh. So they're attracting carrion flies to pollinate them, but then the carrion flies aren't getting anything out of it. All right, so the last interaction I'm gonna talk about today is seed dispersal. And this is, um, this is, something we don't think about as much in the temperate zone because you know this is just a this is a shot of glacier right but any you know think about any ecosystem around here um what plants have fleshy fruits that are evolved to be dispersed by animals we have a few choke cherries you know the edible things choke cherries uh, huckleberries service berries whatever else but the vast majority of the plants that are here are not they're uh, they're conifers that have wind dispersed seeds mostly. They're um, you know, things like maples that have wind dispersed seeds. So the temperate zone, most plants, even trees and shrubs, are not dispersed by animals. But in the tropics, it's the other way around, especially in the New World tropics like the Amazon. 90% of the trees and shrubs are, are dispersed, have fleshy fruits that are dispersed by animals. So it's an incredibly important interaction. Um, and I want to contrast it here with pollination and, and make the point that seed dispersal interactions are much more diffuse, meaning they have many more interacting animals than pollination, than pollination interactions. So this is, this is um, figs, the genus ficus, interacting with animals. And ficus are famous for um, partly for having an incredibly specialized pollination syndrome. It's a huge genus, so it's 700 species of figs. Each one has a single wasp species that pollinates it. And the females, the females are the only ones that ever emerge. They fly, so they find the right fig of the right species. They burrow inside and they lay their eggs. And then they pollinate. So the fig, the fig is like an inside-out inflorescence. So if you cut it in half, you know, cut a right fig in half, it's hollow inside. All those little dots on the inside, those are the flowers. So that the, the fig wasps go inside and they intentionally pollinate the flowers, which blows me away. Because we always think of pollination as this inadvert, inadvertent accidental thing. Female fig wasps are intentionally pollinating the flowers so that the, when they develop seeds, she's laying eggs on other flowers and her larvae will be able to eat the seeds that she pollinated. So this incredibly species-specific pollination interaction 
But then once the figs are pollinated and develop into a ripe fruit, everything eats them. So everything, so birds, these are rhinoceros hornbills, gibbons, other primates, elephants, rhinoceros, um, rodents like squirrels, everything eats the ripe figs. So it's this incredible, you know, asymmetry, super specialized pollination, totally diffuse seed dispersal. All right, so seed dispersal is actually what I, um, I, what I got started off studying. This is what I did my PhD on is, is animal plant seed dispersal in the tropics. So I, I think it's super cool. Um, there, when we think about it in the tropics, there are three main groups of animals that are the, the most important seed dispersers. First one is birds. Um, so tropical birds, you know, there are obviously thousands and thousands of them. Um, some famous biogeographical differences, the old world has hornbills, the new world has two hands. Um, and a lot of people think, okay, those are, these are like interchangeable. You know, the toucan is like the new world hornbill and vice versa. But it's actually not quite that simple because the toucan, even the biggest toucans, this is not the biggest, it's one of the biggest toucans, the keel bill, is um, way, way, way smaller than almost any hornbill. So this is one of the biggest flying hornbills and it's 16 times bigger than a toucan. And then pigeons, I'm going to just throw this up to you. Pigeons, you know, here we think about as these gross animals that live in cities, but there are lots of different pigeons, wild pigeons that are beautiful and strong flyers and incredibly important seed dispersers all over the tropics. So I, I, I'm a big fan of pigeons. Okay, then the second of the big three seed dispersing animal groups are primates. Um, you know, monkeys, apes like us, and then little, this is a tamarind, a little tiny monkey in the process of dispersing banana seeds that, well, full disclosure, we put out on a rating for its feet. Um, but this, so this is from Panama, super cute. But then primates, there's some really interesting um, uh, seed uh, biogeographic differences as well. So this is the biggest neotropical, so Latin American primate, non-human primate. It's the uh, spider monkey. And then this is the biggest arboreal, um, well, this is the biggest Asian, non-human Asian primate, the biggest arboreal primate anywhere, the orangutan. And they're native, they're, they're only found now in, in Borneo and Sumatra. They used to be all over Southeast Asia, but we ate them all from the mainland a long time ago. Um, anyway, again, the biggest, you know, the orangutan is 10 times bigger than the biggest neotropical primate. So we're starting to see a pattern here. And then finally, the third of the big three important seed dispersion groups are bats. And here again, fascinating biogeographical differences. This is the biggest new world fruit eating bat, which is in a, a, a family called the leaf nose bat family. You can see why a leaf shaped nose. And this family actually is incredibly diverse. Vampire bats are in this family. Other species in this family eat fish, frogs, insects, other bats incredibly diverse range of, of food <coughs> items, but then there are a lot of fruit eating species as well. And this, this is an old world fruit bat, totally different, totally unrelated. Um, they're often called flying foxes and they can be just gigantic. So the biggest flying fox outweighs the biggest new world fruit bat by a factor of a hundred. And the flying foxes can literally have wingspans like this big. And you just see them at dusk in a place where, we, where people haven't eaten them all. You see them at dusk just flying across the sky, just huge flocks of them, but they don't flock like a bird. They're, they're all a little bit individually, just winging their way through the sky at sunset. It's just incredible. All right, so the pattern is the New World has much smaller animals in general, but particularly frugivores, fruit eating, seed dispersing animals, than the Old World. And that's led some people to speculate that that's why we get some gigantic fruits in, in, in the old world. Things like durian, the king of fruits, which you're not allowed to bring on airplanes, uh, jackfruit, these are now being sold in Albertsons, which totally blows me away. This is a chebidoc, it's kind of um, the same fam, actually same genus even as the jackfruit, but you get some just gigantic fruits in the old world that you don't get in the new world. People have speculated it's impossible to prove something like this, but it's speculated that's because 
the, the seed dispersing animals are so much bigger in the old world. So I did, now I'll get into a little bit of my work. I did done a little bit of work on this kind of seed dispersal interaction evolution where I took advantage of a, of a natural experiment. So this is the island of Borneo. Uh, this is mainland Asia here. Here's my laser. Um, Sumatra. This region here is called Sunda. It's on the Sunda continental shelf. These, these islands were all connected to the mainland very, very recently, geologically speaking. This, this is a very shallow ocean. The animals and plants are, are all very similar here to mainland Asia. This, New Guinea, is, very, is, is essentially an extension of Australia ge by geographically. And again, very shallow ocean right here until very recently these were connected. So the fauna, the flora and fauna of Australia, of, of tropical Australia, are very similar to that of, of New Guinea. And then these islands in between have never been in, uh, in contact with either. So the, the Maluku, Maluka, Maluka Islands or the Spice Islands. And then this weird um, starship starts, yeah, starfish, not starship, starfish shaped island called Sudalasi. And so what's neat here is you get uh, very Asian animals in the West, in the Sunda area. So you get apes like orangutans and gibbons and um, elephants and deer and whatnot. You don't get any of those in New Guinea. In New Guinea, you have mostly smaller bodied animals, but then the biggest, and it's quite big, frugivore seed disperser is the cassowary, which is like a forest ostrich. It's a rat type bird, um, but it all, unlike the ostrich, it lives in the open ground, it only lives in the forest. And these are, these strictly eat fruit. Actually, and well, as, as do you already found some kids. So these are our big frugivores. And then in between, in Sulawesi and Maluku, you have really no big animals at all, no big seed dispersers. So it's a natural experiment because you get, even though there, there's this dramatic turnover in which animals occur there, but you get the same plant genera across the whole region. Botanically, it's considered just a single realm. Um, so we can look at how the same plant lineages have evolved to interact with these totally different seed dispersing and seed predating animals. And what we'd expect is that, you'd be, that they would have fruits that were a lot smaller in these two regions where there aren't big animals to disperse the seeds. So um, I had the very uh, fun opportunity to just go travel that whole region and collect fruits and measure how big they looked and what color they were and all sorts of other morphological traits. And I did this with my family. And so we got to do, you know, here's Joaquin driving the boat around. And then this is Nico when he was very young. Um, we actually got to do this because I was then a professor at the University of British Columbia and we had about six months parental leave when I had a second baby. So we took our newborn, we took our little baby and moved to Indonesia for six months and went traveling around the whole archipelago collecting fruits. And at this point, I'm working with these guys who are who are just incredible. And we were on a we were on a boat trip. And I said, "Oh man, I wonder if I could get a, get one of those fruits from that tree." And I did, turned around, uh, changed a diaper or something. And I looked back, and they're standing on each other on a boat in the in the water to get to get that fruit. And I'm like, "Oh my god, you guys! I wasn't I wasn't telling you to do that, but it was awesome. They're super great." So, you know, in addition to the myriad baby photos, I have thousands of photos that look like this of all the different fruits we collected and measured and um, stored and whatnot. And then, so back to our map, again, we've got these four regions. The prediction is that we'd have big fruits here where there are big orangutans and elephants eating them. Maybe middle fruits here where we've got cassowaries, but not much else, and smaller fruits in here. And sure enough, that's basically what we found. So we looked just across all different plant lineages. On average, the fruits are substantially bigger in the Sunda region uh, than New Guinea and smaller in these, in these regions in between. And this is a uh, uh, rambutan, another kind of classic um, Asian fruit that's delicious for humans to eat. And there are native endemic species of rambutan in the rambutan genus in Sulawesi and Maluku, they're just much smaller than the Asian variety. Okay, so kind of makes us wonder, 
all right, then how do these fruits get out to islands? And the example I was just showing, Sulawesi and Belugu, they've never been connected to either of the mainlands, but they're very close. But what about islands that are way farther out, like way far out in the middle of the ocean? So I thought, all right, a good extension to this would be to go to some super remote archipelago and look at the fruit traits there. So we did some work. This is Borneo. There's some talking on this is New Guinea. We went out to Palau. You can't even see the island, you just see the word, but there is a little island right there. It's around 800 miles from the nearest other land. And this is, these are what some of the islands look like in Palau, this beautiful, remote, tropical archipelago, seed dispersing primate here. There are no native seeds, actually it's not even dispersing, seed predating primate right there. Um, there are no native primates, there are very few native animals at all. So how do, how do plants get there? And what people will mostly say is they got there from the birds, birds and bats. This is probably the biggest, um, bird, seed, right, the biggest bird, biggest seed dispersing bird, I'll say, in Palau. It's a Palauan fruit dove. Uh, very abundant, very beautiful, but not that big. Smaller than pig, smaller than our wild, our, our city pigeons here, maybe this big. And then there is a, a flying fox endemic to Palau itself. It's not a huge flying fox. So yeah, they almost certainly, when they got there, this is so Palau's been around geologically for around 60 million years. So over that time, you know, the ancestor of the flower and fruit dove was a, another fruit dove on the mainland or on the Philippines, got caught in a storm, flew out to sea, and died. And then another one, you know, maybe a million years later, that happened again. And then somewhere along the line, two of them made it, and a male and female, and they survived and they reproduced and they ended up forming this new species on the island. That's how all these species got there. And they ha would have had some seeds in their guts that they then pooped out. And that's how a lot of plants got to pull out. But this is a, um, this is the Marianas breadfruit. It's, it's in the same genus as the jackfruit that I just showed you. It's a big fruit. It's about this big. The seeds are golf ball size. No way that that bird or even a fruit bat got blown 800 miles across the ocean with a golf ball sized seed in its gut. There's just no way. So plants had to have gotten there some other way. And so a lot of other plants got there just by floating, literally just by floating across the ocean. And this is the classic example of a coconut, of course. Uh, full disclosure, I threw that coconut in water and sat there for an hour trying to get the right picture of it, dispersing its way to the land. But um, Coconuts are indeed native to this whole region, and it's actually a huge debate whether they're um, whether they got to all these islands by themselves or via the Polynesian diaspora. Uh, personally, I tend to think by the latter is much more likely because even coconuts probably can't float that long. We actually don't really have a good sense for how long different seeds can float or what kind of adaptations they would have undergone in order to have the kind of flotation they need. So while we were there. We decided, the, the kids and I decided to do a little experiment on seed flotation. So we collected different fruits, native fruits, some of which are widespread oceanic dispersed species. And then we paired them with an, an endemic Palauan congener. So in other words, so this is uh, Calophyllum anophyllum. You go anywhere in the Indo-Pacific on a beach, you will find this tree. It has seeds that float in salt water and they just disperse everywhere. But sometimes when they get to an island, they get washed inland and they'll, pro and they'll start a new population of, of trees that will lose, the idea is they will lose its adaptation for sea dispersal, for, for ocean dispersal and become a, a terrestrial plant. So we wanted to test that. So we collected um, that and a couple other species. We've got these tubs on our back porch, filled them with seawater, which we get every, every other day from the ocean. And then you know we had our lab notebooks and whatnot. Oh, and I should say too, Palau was the site of a huge battle in World War II. So right behind me, though, this is wreckage from this is like American military debris. There were I mean, you just walk around, they're blown up tanks and down Mitsubishi Zero fighter planes. It's incredible historically. So um, 
So this is what we found. This is Calophyll and Rothlin. This is the ocean dispersed species. When you float them in our little tubs, even after 40 days, which is when we had to call the experiment because we left, um, they were almost all still floating. And then this is uh, also widespread uh, species in the same genus that's not um, thought to be ocean dispersed. And sure enough, they started sinking much more rapidly. And then this is the endemic one, the one that's only found in Palau, that sure enough lost its, its ocean dispersal abilities. And then same thing with these two species of Terminalia. Um, again, if you go to any beach in the Indo-Pacific, you will see this tree, Terminalia catapa. It's the sea almond or the Indian almond, um, totally unrelated to actual almonds. But the Terminalia catapa, incredible seed flotation, and then it's, it's inland island congener, they sink within a day or two. So we don't know how they, we don't have a direct picture of how they evolved the seed dispersal traits. We have here a picture of how they unevolved the seed, the seed, the ocean dispersal traits. Okay, um, I'm going to talk now about <coughs> conservation of species interactions. And I'll start off by talking about hunting. This is actually how I got started looking at, um, at, at, at these kinds of interactions. So um, hunting here is, it tends to be done fairly sustainably, but in most of the rest of the world, it's not. And it leads to defaunation, like the loss of, of animals from the ecosystem. And those animals interact with, of course, the plants and the other organisms in the system. So the chain that I thought would be interesting is that hunting in most of the world is not sustainable and it's driving animals extinct. So as we know, a lot of tropical trees rely on these big animals to disperse their seeds. So without those animals, um, different trees will take over. So it's not like the trees will go away from the forest, but it's different trees will move in that don't rely on the big animals for seed dispersal. And for various reasons, those new trees, or the honest, tend to have lower density with their lighter wood, more like balsa rather than ebony. So what that means is that potentially unsustainable hunting can reduce the total amount of carbon that the whole ecosystem stores. And so the idea again is that the, the trees aren't going away. You go out into an over 100 forest and there's still lots of trees, but they're different trees. They're trees that store less carbon. So my colleague Carlos Perez did a, a, just a simulation of this in the Amazon and showed, well, suggested that the amount that across the entire Amazon basin, the forests could be losing biomass because the densely wooded trees are being replaced by lighter wooded trees. And so if you just some back the angle calculations, extrapolations, that if that is occurring across the tropics, that could be reducing forest carbon storage by 6%, which is equivalent to putting 600 million new cars on the road and amounts to 8% of humanity's total carbon footprint, meaning like industry and shipping and aviation and driving and coal plants, everything, right? Which is huge. So this is something that my lab's been interested in. Um, we want this carbon in the trees, not in the air, is the idea. And so this is this whole like this um, has led to the strategy red, reduced emissions through deforestation and degradation, which is basically trying to keep tropical rainforests from being cut in order to protect the carbon they store. But if these patterns are are, are true and, and are and are real, then that might not be enough. So leaving the forests uncut isn't sufficient, we also need to make sure that the, they're being hunted sustainably. So I've had students doing experimental defaunation. This is my first PhD student, Alice Granados, and she set up exclosures in Danum Valley in Malaysia, where she looked at the effects of um, different sized terrestrial birds. So she's able to exclude elephants from some areas, elephants plus pigs and deer from other areas, elephants plus plagues and deer plus rodents from other areas, and look at how the seedlings responded. And sure enough, she found that experimentally losing mammals in the log forest at least did affect the mean wood density. So it meant that there was a shift in the trees towards lighter wooded species. 
So then I had another yeah. grad student more recently building on this, where he was also he was using the same kind of exclusions, but then also at excluding uh, insects and fungi with insecticide and, and fungicide. And he was able to show that when you exclude um, the vertebrates, so this is the plot, these are the plots that all everything has access to. When you exclude the pigs, the bearded pigs, then the total mortality due to vertebrates goes way down. That's the darker gray bar here. So unsurprisingly, that goes way down. But when you exclude all, all mammals, the total, the, the number of seeds being destroyed by vertebrates goes down to zero, of course. But the number of seeds being destroyed by everything statistically doesn't change. So he was arguing then that the reduced seed predation by mammals in these defaunated plots is completely compensated by mortality, extra mortality from insects and fungi. So honestly, we're not exactly sure what to make of this in a broader picture. But I just wanted to talk about this to show the complexity of these interactions. It's never just animal A interacting with plant B. It's everything's embedded in these bigger webs. And then, but the solution, of course, the solution to unsustainable hunting is not, at least in these systems, usually going to be governmental regulation, but it's going to be community-led sustainable hunting. And I've, I've worked with a number of different villages not directly to implement new hunting practices by any means, but just to have different degrees of interest in trying to do this on their own, which is, I think, something that's going to be really important. Okay, I'm going to end with two examples of conserving um, the species interactions and the species that play them. One is work I've done on connectivity, habitat connectivity in the state of Sarawak. So Sarawak is the largest state in Malaysia. Um, it's on the island of Borneo. And this is their emblem, which is their coat of arms, which of course is a hornbell, red ostrich hornbell. So we think, all right, they love seed dispersers there. <laughs> they, well, turns that they love to eat them too. But um, this is the island of Borneo, third biggest island in the world. The green splotches are protected areas, national parks and wildlife reserves. So that's actually pretty good protected area coverage for anywhere in the world, but especially a, a, a tropical country. But the problem is that even those big national parks are too small on their own for big wide ranging animals like clouded leopards and rhinoceros hornbills and elephants and orangutans. So the solution of course is to not let them become on their own but rather to make sure that they're linked to each other by habitat corridors, by strips of habitat that will connect them so that these important seed dispersing animals and predators and whatever else can move between the parks. So um, again, I did a lot of field work on this. This is us when Joaquin was very young. We were staying in this very rudimentary shelter way out in the woods. Um, you can see we always wear these socks, and those are leech socks. You can keep the terrestrial leeches, which are a big thing in Southeast Asia, from crawling up your legs and eating it. Um, so we did. We, we need camera trapping. We put out hundreds of cameras all over the place in different ecosystems, every gradient we can imagine, and we crunched all those numbers into models to be able to map um, habitat selection by different animals, and then where animals would need to go in order to get between parks. So this is just a, an output of one of our models, the green blobs of the national parks, and then these are showing the most important dispersal routes that, that the animals would take to get between them. So then we can go to the government, which we did, and present a statewide plan for habitat corridors across Sarawak. And this is work that I've been doing for now 13 years with my friends Muhammad Aslan and Jason Hahn at um, the local university, University of Malaysia Sarawak and the World Wildlife Fund, respectively. And you know, it's only through these kind of local partnerships that someone like I can do anything. Um, but these guys are great. And we've, you know, so we have this Sarawak um, corridor report and plan that we're now very slowly trying to um, chip away and, and get actually implemented into law. And then the last um, example I'll talk about is in the other big Malaysian state on Borneo, Sabah. So, so this is Sarawak here. This is Sabah up to the northeast of it. And Sabah, the state of Sabah, had around 24% protected area coverage. 
they of their own accord decided they wanted to increase it to 30%. This is 10 years ago or so. Um, so that would entail around 400,000 hectares of new conservation area, which is about equivalent to a new glacier national park. But they didn't know if they wanted one big new glacier national park or a whole bunch of small ones or some corridors or some mixture of all those things. So they worked with me and a couple of colleagues to crunch the biodiversity data and, and tell them what the best solution would be for where to put these new protected areas. So we, put, we had a table of a lot of species we were interested in, plants, pollinating butterflies, mammals, amphibians, birds. We threw all these into a, an optimization analysis where we, we told the computer, we want we here here where our here where our plants live here where our vertebrates live our invertebrates we want to preserve elevational connectivity in other words corridors running up the side of the mountain that's for climate change mitigation so if the lowlands get too hot animals can and plants can move up to where it's cooler um, corridors between parks so the kind of things I was talking about the Sarawak and then above ground carbon we want to preserve as much dense forest as we can to help Malaysia fulfill its international targets for climate mitigation. So those were the input layers. The computer comes out with the optimal solution, which looked, oh man, uh, sorry, this is totally blown out of uh, proportion somehow. Anyway, this is like a corner of the state. I'm not sure why I did that, but we had what this map is supposed to show is where the existing protected areas are for Saba, and then where our new protected areas, new suggested protected areas would be. And it wasn't one big park, it wasn't a whole bunch of tiny ones, it was about three medium sized parks, all of which were important, protecting important forests in their own right, but also protecting areas that were really important for connectivity. And one of them in particular is an area that I've done a lot of work in, and, and so I was really excited to see it come out as, as, as super important. This is the Ulu Paras region in the, in the very southwestern tip of Saba, where, I, where we worked out of the uh, community of Montasia here. This is my buddy Pengaran Salutan, local, local man who lives in the village and is just super interested in like hunting sustainability and all things progressive. It was super weird to just walk into this village and meet this guy who had all these amazing ideas about these, the same kind of things that I love thinking about. Um, and then the area is just rich in all sorts of things too. There are carnivorous pitcher plants. There are um, all sorts of cute primates, both native and non-native. Um, <laughs> really wonderful area. So I'll wrap it up there. Um, and with you know, a couple key hope, key, key take-home points. I think that you know, biodiversity is amazing. The species that make it biodiversity is amazing, but it's the interactions among the species there also super amazing and, and i think they're a fundamental part of biodiversity um plant animal interactions could be partly responsible for why there's so many species in tropical forests why there are um plants out on remote oceanic archipelagos all sorts of, of patterns in life human activities of course can affect not just can drive not just the loss of species but thereby the loss of those interactions and so if we design conservation actions based on protecting key interactions, for example, protecting critical sea dispersers or critical herbivores or critical apex carnivores, then that can potentially be more effective than just single species conservation strategies. All right, so lots of people to thank. These are who I won't list all by name, but this is my lab actually a few years ago. I need an updated version. Um, Olga, again, taking that close picture of something. And thank you all so much again. I really appreciate the invitation and I'm more than happy to take questions. Yes. What's the role of army ants in the ecosystem? Mm. <laughs> army ants are super fascinating. So the army ants are incredibly big swarms and they just, they don't have a home. Of course, they sweep through the forest and they're nomadic. And I think their role, I'm sure they play an important role as insectivores, regulating insect populations. But to me, their most interesting role is evolutionary 
that there are ant birds, that there are multiple families of birds only in the neotropics. Because that's what, army ants are only in the neotropics. So these ant birds have evolved and become super diverse. There are hundreds of species of ant birds only in the neotropics that follow ants. That's all they do is follow the ant swarm, picking up the insects that are fleeing from the army ants. And so that, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a commensalism. The birds are getting advantage, the ants are not affected at all. Um, but that commensalism, commensalism has led to this radiation of bird species that just blows me away. So the army ants are carnivorous, they eat other insects? They're strictly carnivorous, yeah. Are there issues with invasive, invasive species? Um, yeah, it's a good question. In general, no. In general, undisturbed tropical rainforests are very resistant to invasion because they're already so packed with native species. Um, there are some exceptions, like along a disturbed roadway, be, there can be a lot of invasions. On islands, there can be a lot of invasions. But for in Borneo, you know, in the lowland intact rainforest in Borneo, where I work, there aren't a lot of invasions. We went to Hawaii soon, and I'm just wondering if there's issues, you know, com comparable issues. Invasive species are certainly a huge issue there in their islands. Uh, but is there anything particular to that part of the world? I mean, it's a long ways, but the Polynesian migration was part of it as well. Yeah. And it's not, it's not really what you're talking about, but if you had points. Yeah. I mean, Hawaii is just so incredible, but so sad. <laughs> Yeah, the invasion there is just insane. The mongooses and cats and rats and mosquitoes and their malaria. And, um, yeah, so that's that's a case where invasion invasive species are just utterly destroying the place and driving extinctions like in real time, like month to month, things going extinct from that. Um, but otherwise, you know, I'm sure some of the patterns I talked about with colonization of plants over geologic time. Have, you know, that's how Hawaii got its plants as well. Some mixture of being brought there by birds and bats and ocean, oceanic flotation. I mentioned earlier that uh, a lot of the indigenous people decimated a lot of the animals and maybe some of the plants along the way. Has that changed over the years or are there no, I mean, what do they, what do they eat now? And, how did they change their lives? To... Right. Yeah. Um, I should say that, I mean, I think hunting induced extinctions have happened everywhere. And we certainly did our fair share here. Um, you know, I mean, passenger pigeon was the most abundant bird ever in the history of Earth, probably, and we drove it completely extinct. Um, so I think, you know, some other cultures that are, that have, have just done it more recently, so it's more, we're, we're more aware of it. Um, but I think there's, there's, it's just, it's like anywhere. There's some, you know, there's over harvest, over exploitation of a natural resource in some areas and in other areas. Um, there are people, you know, who are more concerned about not doing that. Often it's when the resource has already been exploited. They call it um, post depletion sustainability, which is this funny term meaning, yeah, you can be sustainable once all the vulnerable things are extinct. <laughs> um, which is kind of what happened here, right? I mean, the mammoths are gone, right? The jet cave lines are gone. So all the vulnerable things are extinct. So now we can be sustainable with yield here and help. Um, I guess that I guess I would say that it's that same pattern just on a different time scale. Um, but there are lots of groups working to do to address hunting sustainability in Asia. Um, I don't I, was it the cutter ants that did that defoliation right outside your window? Yeah. What keeps them in check so they don't just decimate? I mean, what keeps them in balance? I have no idea. Um, I was wondering about it because they would, they often would defoliate a tree like 90% and then stop and not kill it outright. And I, I haven't, I've never heard this anywhere, but just my, my hypothesis is that they've got the gardener ants back underground who are like keeping, who are keeping track of the, of the nutrients that are coming in. And they're like, all right, no, no, we've got enough of that thing. We're a little bit high on nitrogen. We need something more phosphorus. And so they'll be like, stop, go get that one instead. Um, so their population just isn't too filled in, not going to build in up like mountain pine beetle. There, yeah, there must be something regulating like the population level. And uh, if I had to guess, I would say mites 
some kind of parasite. I don't think they're they're not they're not really predated. Even anteaters, you know, their their burrows are super deep, so even an anteater can't dig it out and get the food. And there's so many of them. If an anteater dug a little ways, got some, it would be drawing them up. You know, rather than thinking that there's sort of an external stop, we have enough with a lot of, um, say, migratory herbivores, it's actually the chemistry of the plant. They start producing bitter principles that the herbivore no longer is interested in mm -hmm. eating. They stop being palatable. Mm -hmm. So it forces the, the predator to move on. Yeah. yeah. So I wonder if that could be happening. I don't know if an ant has a taste bud. Oh, they certainly do. So I think it could be, but that. it's also the time frame. The time frame seemed like it was on the hour, you know, order like one day they were defoliating this and the next day. But plants can respond so quickly yeah. to the chem we do chemistry of plants and fungi. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And so if you look at those chemical components, uh -huh. they can change pretty rapidly. In one, yeah, 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 so that's a possibility. Yeah. But the question I actually had was you speak up a little bit so sure. we can all hear. Sure. Thanks. You looked at the denim area, and you said it was not um, harvested. It was an intact ecosystem. What made it so protected? Yeah, the only the only places that are still protected like that are protected topographically. So there was some. It was inaccessible okay. through some combination of mountains and rivers. You didn't mention uh, reptiles like snakes. Do they have a role in the seed dispersal or interesting interactions? Yeah, it's a good question. So snakes, <coughs> no, because they're, snakes are entirely carnivorous. There are no herbivorous snakes. But snakes are just an offshoot of, of lizards. And there are, there are some, you know, some herbivorous lizards, including the green iguana, which is the biggest neotropical lizard. And it's super common. That was the other thing we do in the morning. We sit out and watch the hummingbirds, but also try to count the iguanas. And just in our little backyard, every morning, there'd be four or five huge iguanas up in the tops of the trees. They climb up to the top of the tree in the morning to get sun, and then they climb down later. And they're strictly herbivorous. So they, I think, probably can have, probably could have a, a, a reasonable um, herbivory impact. And then there's some, not so much in the areas I've worked, but some remote oceanic islands, um, tortoises can be important sea dispersers. So, uh, I don't know if the Galapagos tortoise is or not, but there, there are Galapagos tortoise-like things, or at least there were, on Mauritius and, and other Indian Ocean islands that were considered very important seed dispersers. So they eat fruits and disperse the seeds, just like a cassowary or an ape or something. What do you find is the source of innocence to get those loyalists? Um, it's... I mean, there's got to be a governmental interest. So I think in this in this case, we're playing up two things. One is that Malaysia had signed uh, a, a trinational agreement with Indonesia and Brunei, the other countries on Borneo, to to do something called the Heart of Borneo, where they had agreed, like at the at the federal level, they agreed to set aside corridors to keep to keep linkages. And so we were able to say, hey, Marty have to do this we can help you help you know show you how really um i think the next thing beyond that and beyond just malaysia is that um hopefully you're all aware this just this last december the united nations agreed to what's called the 30 by 30 goal which is it says like 30 percent of the planet has protected areas by the year 2030 and not just 30 percent but 30 percent of protected of well connected protected areas and nobody really knows exactly what that means, the well-connected bit. But I think that's that's the kind of leverage to use with the government. So it says, hey, you agreed to this. You're a signatory to UN. So we can help you figure out what it means to be well-connected and how to, how to do that. Does that answer your question? Yes. OK. <laughs> and yes. So what impacts are climate change doing to Borneo compared to the northern here? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, nobody really knows. So a lot of ecologists for a long time have said that tropical, or sorry, that climate change will have the greatest impacts at higher latitudes. 
but that's just because that the, the magnitude of temperature changes created it. So the Arctic is warming by five degrees, whereas the tropics are only warming by two degrees. But I think that I think that the tropics are going to have huge impacts because, well, partly because a two degree rise, you know, a lot of organisms we think are living kind of close to their thermal maximum anyway in the tropics. So if you crank it up two more degrees, that could be it for a lot of things. Or they could all have to try to move up mountains, but you know, a lot of places like the Amazon basin, there are no mountains in, mo in most of it. Um, nobody really knows, but it's, yeah, it's really scary. Jed, I have a chat question yeah. from Carrie Forsman. Yeah. Can you ask Jed if logging around the Danum Valley has decreased at all over the past 15 years? <laughs> Um, hi, Carrie. Um, I'm going to say probably because most of Saba, they're not logging much anymore because they've already logged everything they can. They're logging, well, let me take it back. They're not cutting down new forest. They're, re, they're, they're doing new cycles in new rotations in the existing logging concessions, but they're not uh, converting more forest in Saba because they've already really converted everything they can. Sarawak, that's not the case. They're definitely still cutting down forest in Sarawak. Indonesia, still cutting down a lot of forest. Okay, thanks. I had a question on the um, connectivity uh, that you showed. Uh, they looked kind of narrow. Were those, do you think, still pretty effective? <clears throat> yeah. yeah, that's a good question. So. That, that particular example we are just showing was a just cartoon, but we don't really, we, we actually, we, we've got pretty good um, models to tell us where to put the corridor and how long it can be and still be effective. We don't have great, we don't have a great way to do width yet. So that's still a kind of guesswork. Um, the, the rule of thumb is like <coughs> twice, the, twice the width of the largest animals' territory. So in this case, it'd be clouded leopard, which I figure out what's their home range size, double that, and that's how wide the corridor should be. Yes, a lot of it's going to be impacted by edge effects. A lot of it's going to be hunted. Um, but, you know, the, we're, we're not trying to set aside these areas necessary for animals to live in, just so it can be suboptimal habitat, just so they can get through it. I was wondering the human population in these areas. What's happening there? Um, well, they, a lot of Asia, Asia's, uh, I think, still increasing somewhat rapidly. Uh, it's Asia, tropical Asia has much higher human density already than tropical than Latin America. So the Amazon has way lower human density than anywhere in the world. Um, Probably because of that, I would guess that the population growth rate is higher in the Amazon. Um, but yeah, I guess I, I don't actually know too well about human population growth. Economically, you know, Malaysia is essentially a developed country by now. Um, Indonesia is not, not quite, but um, yeah, they're doing very well. It's a reasonably wealthy country. Let me check chat one more time. I just see some thank yous and so. If there are no further questions, let's give Jed one last round of applause. That was wonderful. That was so are your kids still into um, science? Um, let's, let's do our one of them. <laughs> the the young. And you that this was and, uh, life changing for them. Have their cookies. <laughs> Make us all